Okay, uh, good morning and welcome to the 24th meeting in 2015 of the Health and Sport Committee. I would ask everyone in the room to switch off mobile phones as they can interfere with the sound system. You will see some of the MSPs today using tablet devices. This is instead of hard copies of our papers. We have received apologies this morning from Nanette Millen and our convener, Duncan McNeil, so they can't make it today and they, they send their apologies. Our first item on the agenda is a presentation by Professor David Clark. Thank you, Professor Clark, for coming along this morning uh, on your report, International Comparisons in Palliative Care Provision. What can the indicators tell us? This report was commissioned by the committee and will inform the committee's inquiry into palliative care. Uh, now, I want to record my thanks on behalf of the whole committee for the hard work that you have put into to this report. Um, it is a substantial piece of work. Uh, and in a moment, I'm going to invite you uh, to make a presentation to the committee, maybe for around 10 minutes, that we would find that helpful. But maybe just as a as a small but important aside as well, I think the, the the media coverage that your report got this morning, and several members heard you in Good Morning Scotland, an early start this morning, Professor Clark, there's a real kind of positive and constructive dynamic about how we acknowledge good work that happens in palliative care, but not been afraid to tackle where the gaps are and drive forward change. So we really appreciate the body of work that you've done in pulling some of those uh, statistics uh, together. So thank you very much, Professor Clark, and could ask you to um, make your opening presentation. Well, thank you for that welcome and, and words of introduction. Uh, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to both present the report and, and to introduce it this morning and answer questions on it. Um, I'd like to begin in the spirit that you've already begun, which is to uh, try and build on some of the s significant achievements uh, in Scotland uh, and the wider influence of Scotland in the world of palliative care. I don't want to digress too much into a history lesson, but uh, it's not widely known that the first ever home for the dying that was established in the United Kingdom was... Um, created by uh, a woman from Donside in Aberdeenshire, Frances Davidson, who moved to the east end of London and opened um, the, uh, a home for the dying there in 1885. Um, in the course of the 20th century, we've seen uh, developments in hospice services uh, in Scotland. We've seen the growth of interest and, and influence of some of the major charities, Marie Curie and Macmillan in particular, um, and we've seen as well a, a very key role in the formation of what we call the modern hospice movement, that f aspect of hospice care that is not just about the delivery of uh, excellent care to people in need, but also about education and research and wider engagement with uh, society. Uh, again, I, I think I'd like to pay, pay tribute to Dr. Derek Doyle, who was the first medical director of St. Columba's Hospice uh, here in Edinburgh, and who was really instrumental in uh, gaining the recognition for palliative medicine as a medical specialty in Britain in, in the 1980s, and went on to be a major advocate for palliative care around the world. So I, th I think there's quite a lot to celebrate in terms of uh, the contribution that's been made uh, in Scotland to the field of palliative and hospice care, and also uh, in terms of the kinds of resources that we currently have available uh, to deliver care to uh, people in our country. The situation that we have in Scotland really is quite different to the wider global context where I've been trying to, uh, over time, uh, analyse the development of palliative care in all the countries of the world. And as you've seen from the report, we estimate that there are really only 20 countries in the world that have an advanced level of palliative care development. Uh, well, we're referring to things like um, the availability of the appropriate drugs for pain and symptom management, um, the provision of services uh, in acute and, and community settings, uh, the provision of education programmes, the existence of a body of research, and perhaps most importantly, um, underpinning policies and strategy on the part of governments uh, to support the uh, delivery and development of palliative care. Um, really very few countries in the world that are um, 
uh, kitted out, if you like, uh, with those elements. And indeed, in a very recent estimate, the WHO, World Health Organization, has estimated that probably only 14% of the world's population who are in need of palliative care get any kind of access to it. But we uh, live in changing times. We have to continue to review uh, what we're doing, uh, even in countries with well-developed palliative care. And I think the key uh, element of that discussion is that we're moving from hospice and palliative care being seen as the business of specialists of one sort or another, the people who've spearheaded the development of the field, uh, to uh, hospice and palliative and end-of-life care becoming the business of everybody. Uh, more the business of generalists, uh, but um, in a wider context, uh, a concern that we should all engage with uh, as an aspect of um, civil society uh, and the wider society and communities in which we live. Um, so it's time, in my opinion, to take stock of where we've got to. There's lots of good things to acknowledge and to celebrate. Um, but I, I think we need to ask the question, uh, how much palliative care are we delivering and uh, are we properly resourced to do that? And my report is really trying to set out um, how we go about exploring that question and the kind of indicators that we would need to have uh, in order to provide some answers. And those are indicators about the supply of services, uh, about the need which those services are oriented to meet, uh, about the extent to which we have good access uh, and complete coverage of all of those uh, in need of palliative care. Uh, and perhaps most critically and most difficult of all, um, what we know about the outcomes of the care that is provided. How good is it? Uh, is it appropriate? Is it well received by those uh, to whom it's delivered? Uh, and and what, uh, at what kind of qu quality? Uh, my conclusion is that... Um, we, we have problems in answering these questions, and we're not alone in this. Uh, uh, Scotland is really uh, not alone in, in having uh, difficulties in uh, giving clear answers to questions of this type. But I've tried to offer some um, uh, solutions that we might explore uh, in order to uh, be better equipped to uh, address those issues when uh, questions are quite reasonably put uh, along the lines of how good uh, is palliative care in our country. I think we need to be uh, better equipped to deliver some uh, fairly succinct uh, but robust answers uh, to questions uh, of that kind. So what I'm really recommending is a, a number of things which I'd be happy to elaborate on. But um, I think, first of all, we need a, a reasonably robust mapping exercise of the delivery of, of uh, specialist palliative care in Scotland as I've said in my report, we, we are unable to um, um, model palliative care delivery in Scotland against other countries because all of the reporting of it uh, takes place in a context where Scottish data is buried within data of the United Kingdom as a whole. So I think the time has come to um, create, a, a, if you like, a, an atlas entry uh, for palliative care in Scotland that would allow us to compare with other countries, for example, of <coughs> similar, <coughs> similar uh, population and type to our own. The second thing I think that would be worth doing, and which was done in Ireland recently, is to conduct a systematic review of research that has been done in Scotland on palliative care uh, to assess its quality and to get um, more uh, lessons and uh, uh, action points out of it than we currently do. Um, there is good work going on in our universities. Uh, some of it's not very well known. Uh, I think by reviewing it systematically, uh, we could uh, do a lot more to uh, learn from that work and to disseminate uh, the results more widely. It's not uncommon, uh, if you're involved in research in this field, to be somewhat disappointed uh, when you talk about work that you've done, which you thought was well known to other people, but to where some of the intended audience is still, uh, for no, through no fault of their own, uh, still unaware of it. So I think uh, a systematic review and a wide dissemination of the work that's uh, been conducted in recent years would be extremely useful. I also think that we need more investment uh, in uh, measuring uh, the ways in which we identify people who could benefit from palliative care. Uh, I've made the distinction in my document between um, that question as a public health issue, how many people need palliative care, uh, but also as a clinical issue, uh, how do we identify those people uh, when we're in front of them and when we're referring them to appropriate services. 
Uh, and as I've highlighted, uh, there is a, a good measure that's being developed by colleagues uh, uh, here at the University of Edinburgh uh, and in the Lothian region, the SPICT. Uh, but it's still at a relatively early stage of its development, and I, I think more work needs to be done on uh, uh, refining measures of that kind that will enable clinicians quickly and accurately to identify patients and families uh, who would benefit from palliative care and could be referred to it, um, whether that be specialist care or that which can be provided uh, by uh, general physicians, general practitioners, and the wider health and social care team. Um, and then finally, I think we need to agree on the appropriate uh, quality uh, indicators that we would like to have to assess the robustness of uh, palliative care of all stripes uh, as it's delivered in Scotland, uh, and then to invest in the measures that will allow us to uh, gather the, the data to support those indicators uh, and to disseminate them and to learn from them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Clark. And uh, I should have given you a full title at the start. Um, you are the Wellcome Trust Investigator School of Interdisciplinary Studies, University of Glasgow. My apologies for for not giving you your your full title. Um, thank you. As we always like to say, uh, that is now <laughs> on the you. record. Absolutely. Mm. Um, we'll move to uh, our first question, which is from Malcolm Chisholm. Um, thanks very much, first of all, for your for your report. Um, I mean, I'd like to start really with with definitions and numbers, and, and perhaps. <coughs> definitions has to come first. I mean, I suppose a lot of people don't quite get the, a lot of people think of it very much as end of life care, but obviously palliative care has a different definition. But I suppose I'm, I'm partly wondering if, if, if we have an agreed definition of that, because some people might say in terms of, you know, a lot of people living with pain, chronic conditions, uh, you, you might want to stretch the definition because people are always going to try and palliate people's pain and suffering, even if it's so. Is there quite a, a clear definition in the context of what we're talking about or, or, or could it actually become so stretched that we're not quite sure what we're talking about? I didn't want to muddy the waters too much uh, on this, uh, although it is a, an interest of mine. There are many definitions uh, around. A, a recent systematic review of definitions of palliative care in English and German came up with 56 variants um, my own position is that I don't. I think we would need some persuading to depart from the definition of the WHO, uh, most recently published. It's uh, produced two definitions. Um, I think, though, that the um, there's an awareness that what we mean by palliative care is changing. When um, hospice and, and palliative care first uh, began to develop, uh, the focus was very much on people with cancer. Uh, at the end stage of their disease and where the trajectory was relatively short and fairly predictable and uh, hospice and palliative care uh, came in at that point. Um, over the years, the WHO and many others have advocated for earlier intervention uh, on the part of palliative care. Um, and that is raising some complex uh, debates, not least in the United States, uh, where it's tied up with reimbursement issues as well. There's a strong argument among the palliative care leadership in the United States that we should drop all references to end-of-life care, death, dying, bereavement, uh, and describe palliative care as an extra layer of support which helps people through the inevitable stresses, strains, uh, and challenges of their illness uh, at all stages of that illness trajectory. I think here in Scotland and, and in the rest of the UK, we still see palliative care as closely associated with end-of-life care. And the broad uh, reference point for end-of-life care is people in the last 12 months of their lives. But as I've often said, it's easier to say who those people are with the retrospectoscope than it is with the uh, any any kind of prospective approach. And we are challenged to know uh, when people are in the last year of life and how best we can uh, respond to them in that context. But there's no doubt that palliative care has a place to, to a part to play uh, at earlier stages of disease progression. Um, I think as we age as a society, as people grow older and live longer. Um, some of us will be challenged by multiple morbidities, not just cancer, but uh, other chronic conditions. And uh, I think it's well accepted that palliative care has a role to play, as you say, in the palliation uh, of some of the problems associated with those conditions. Now, in terms of the numbers, and, and you give some <coughs> estimates in your report, I mean, is the issue there that services aren't available or is the main issue that people are not being identified? And I suppose related to that is we have these 
GP registers? We, we, is there a problem there? And is, 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 is it through more effective use of them that we deal with that problem? Or how, how do we manage to identify those who are not receiving the palliative and end of life care that they might benefit from? Well, the, the, the registers are a very good start. Um, they have been changing in character. We've had uh, palliative care registers for some time and then new, more recent approaches have been introduced in Scotland. Um, still at a fairly early stage and we haven't done the studies yet I think some of them are underway that would tell us whether these registers are reaching all the people that are in need they seem to be quite effective in logging people with cancer uh, less effective in people with uh, non-malignant conditions um, and in both cases there's still some evidence that they are only registering people t towards the end uh, of their lives. So we would like to see wider coverage, but also um, earlier registration. Um, I think this is an all systems issue where we're, we're really seeking to raise awareness across the health and social care sector about the need to be uh, vigilant about identifying people who have uh, palliative care needs and might benefit from palliative care. Um, as uh, the committee may know, I, I published a paper with colleagues uh, in 2014 where we, we showed that on any given day in Scotland, 29% of all inpatients in hospital are in the last year of life and that 9% of uh, all inpatients in hospital will die on that admission. The, the point about that study is it provides a wonderful opportunity for hospitals to think more actively about the identification of patients who are... Uh, in their care at any given moment who unequivocally have end-of-life needs. But we haven't yet got simple measures that will uh, enable those people to be more readily uh, identified at scale. Last question, because I know others want to follow this up. But So if we were successful in identifying all those people, I mean, is the way forward, as I think you suggested in your opening statement, that basically it has to be taken on board by a larger number of people, generalists and so on? Or do, you, or do you think there is scope for the expansion of what you might call the specialists, the people who work in hospices or in community teams around hospices? I mean, I mean how would you see that um, unmet need being addressed, as it were? I'd like to do a proper modelling exercise of the specialist provision that we have in Scotland based on the guidelines of the European Association for Palliative Care. That would enable us to assess whether we've got our specialist provision more or less right. I think we then would have an evidence-based approach to that. But whether or not that is the case, uh, we certainly need to make palliative care more the business of a lot of other people. And I think perhaps one of the difficulties has been that um, there is still perhaps a perception of palliative care that it's something that comes in to, uh, right at the end uh, and that it's something that involves giving up other things. So if I pass my patient to palliative care services, I'm losing my involvement with them, uh, I'm losing the opportunity to go on actively treating their disease. As members of the committee probably know, this is exactly the way in which hospice care is funded in America at the moment, although it is about to change. But to go on to a hospice program in the US, you must have a prognosis of less than six months to live, and you must give up all active treatment. Um, this isn't a desirable position. It's not one that we would want to see here. Um, but I think maybe in, within the mindset, there's still um, on the part of some clinicians a feeling that there is a transition to palliative care that involves giving up certain things in order to access it. And that, that's something we need to work on right from the very beginning with our medical students, our nursing students, uh, and, and to try and promulgate more widely that palliative care has this uh, integrated role within the spectrum of care that we deliver to a person. Thank you. Thank you, Malcolm. Professor Clark, I'm just wondering in terms of identifying those in receipt of palliative care or th those in need of palliative care, one of the things that this committee is working on at the moment is the Care of Scotland Bill in terms of uh, uh, working with young people to have a young carer statement or with older people to have an adult carer's assessment. Now, I, I would suspect as people make their, and I think through our own family experiences, we'd be aware of this as well, as people make a transition towards palliative care, there are family and friends and loved ones actively involved in care. And there's a piece of legislation going through this parliament which seeks to capture every individual in that caring process. Might that be an opportunity in terms of identifying those in society 
who are making that transition toward palliative care. Because I, I know we want to go on to talk about how we support people better, but we have to obviously identify where those in need of additional support are before we can we can resource and provide that additional support as best we can. Might that be an opportunity? I think it definitely is. I've tended to be using a rather medical language uh, at the moment, talking about patients and their needs. But of course, the key thing about palliative care is that it, it's supporting carers and families uh, and, and others directly affected by the, the illness and impending death of a person and uh, seeks to assess the needs of, of families and carers uh, in, in, in delivering care. So what the kind of example that you have just given affords, I think, is an opportunity to seed thinking about, language about, uh, ideas about, information, evidence about palliative care uh, across a spectrum uh, of other policy instruments, guidelines uh, and statements from government and I think that's what we badly need well um, at the moment there's uh, looking around the world um, palliative care is still very much in a kind of early advocacy stage where it's trying to draw attention to what it is help people to better understand it the next step is then to get uh, those ideas integrated more widely across the health and social care system of any any country and that means seeing that language in the documents that appear from government thank you very much professor clark uh, dennis robertson uh, thank you, convener. Uh, convener was sort of going down the, the sort of line that, that I was going to pursue, but perhaps maybe before uh, I continue on that line, uh, Professor, and um, can I say that uh, I was listening to you early this morning, uh, I think about 6.40 this morning, you were on GMS, and you mentioned specifically about the, the, the specialists and how you then maybe have this sort of generalist approach. I just want to maybe tease out a wee bit more about this sort of generalist approach, uh, including the maybe the allied professionals, and as the convener has um, stated this morning, the, the friends and family. Because when we do evidence at, uh, in, when we were looking at the uh, assisted suicide bill, one of the things that came out very clearly is that culturally in Scotland, we don't fa face death very well. We don't talk about dying we don't make provision for is this a barrier i think it's an important issue and uh, the palliative care community in scotland is doing some excellent work to try and address it um we uh, have seen a number of uh, examples of that in in the last few years death on the fringe um the uh, good life good death good grief initiative uh, the Absent Friends Initiative, all promulgated by the Scottish Partnership uh, for Palliative Care. I think they, they and others, uh, myself included, I write regularly on a blog and, and we run death cafes and, and the like, um, are trying to uh, create a wider conversation across society about mortality and death. My own experience of the death cafe phenomenon is it's remarkably easy to get people to talk about death once you've brought them together and given them the opportunity. The notion that it's a taboo is, is quickly uh, um, uh, unpacked when you sit people down with a cup of coffee and uh, an opportunity to talk about these things. So I think there's a great deal of work that could be done there. I would like to see um, a wider conversation. I'd also like to see our major institutions taking these, the, these issues more seriously, the universities, uh, the business world the faith groups, I think they all have a significant part to, to play in a, a wider conversation about uh, care at the end of life and uh, perhaps the limits of medicine, what, what can we really expect from our healthcare system and at what point uh, do we uh, acknowledge that the focus is really on, on palliation, on comfort, on dignity at the end of life. Uh, these are things which are relatively intangible, somewhat difficult to measure, but not necessarily particularly costly to deliver. Uh, this pathway, this journey, maybe towards palliative care, uh, for some people moving from someone who's being cared for, and this could sort of be across all ages in, in some respects, but someone moving just from requiring care to maybe requiring nursing care, and then perhaps palliative care. How do we? How do we actually? How do we identify when the patient requires that palliative uh, care? in that transition period uh, and how do the the families the uh, not just the medical professions but those uh, allied professionals as well how do we then 
uh, I suppose uh, that's recognise that we're at that stage for palliation. Yeah. I think there are a number of triggers that uh, can be identified but which need to be put together and a conclusion reached. But there are things like um, repeat uh, admission into hospital. Um, there are things like um, prolonged unrelieved uh, symptom uh, difficulties uh, or pain, uh, even when the uh, concurrent care for the condition appears to be optimal. Um, they are things like um, dwindling mood, um, uh, a depressed affect. There are lots of things that we can do. Uh, the, the, the difficulty is that sometimes these things, perhaps particularly for families, they're, 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 they creep up on us slowly uh, and they're, they're difficult to identify uh, day by day. But I think the clinician's role is to try and put these things together in a bundle and say, look, this, uh, there's a, a light flashing here. We need to be thinking differently. We need to be having a conversation. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, families yeah. and other carers sort of become, they, they adjust because it's with them 24-7 and perhaps don't recognise. So are you saying that really it, it is down to clinicians to be able to identify when it's moved on that journey towards the, 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 the need for palliative care? I think they are key, but um, again, if I could use the American example, there's a lot of work going on trying to encourage uh, service users themselves to self-monitor and then to ask for palliative care. Uh, I think that's an interesting model. Um, so the, 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 these are the, some of the aspects that, that, that we can uh, attend to. I, I was very, very impressed listening to the Reith lecturer from last year, Atul Gawanda, who gave the key lecture uh, at the Royal College of Physicians in Edinburgh in uh, November of, uh, of last year, where he talked about the kinds of simple questions that people should be thinking about putting in this context. What do you understand by your condition at the moment? Um, what are the limits on the things that are acceptable to you? Um, what, what would you most like to happen? What do you not want to happen? Basic questions that, if, if asked and put to a person, will often re re result in very, very good information. But they're not routine. And there's one notion around that you should have these kinds of questions built into your system just as routinely as you ask them, um, are you allergic to penicillin? You know, I think that's quite an, an interesting analogy that we're routinely thinking of those questions in the way that we might about allergies. And, and finally, if, if you think, maybe just one more follow-up question yeah. so some of our colleagues can get in as well. Yeah, just yeah. finally. Yeah. And how important <coughs> is uh, this awareness for the health and social care agenda that we're moving into at the moment? How important is it that we become fully aware, just as the World Health Assembly said in you know, 2014 about this requirement to have it uh, as part of an integral part of our, our services within all our health uh, boards? Well, you, you made the point earlier about the social dimensions of this, and uh, for most people, dying isn't a medical event. It's a social and personal one, and the personal and social services are critical to this. But again, they've tended not to be prominent in the dialogue about how we deliver end-of-life care. I think integration uh, of health and social care gives a wonderful opportunity uh, to address this more actively, uh, to reduce inequalities, to promote uh, equality, but also to build on the assets that exist in communities already. Uh, I, I began by talking about the assets that we have in specialist palliative care, but we have huge assets in our families and communities that we can build on if we can properly support those who are able to give help. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Clark. Um, Mike McKenzie to be followed by Rhoda Grant. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, Professor Clark, I was very interested in, and, and disappointed actually that in your suggestion that we um, don't have the data necessary to fully understand uh, the, the current situation with regard to palliative care in Scotland. I'm not quite sure if that's because of a lack of data overall or because of a, an inability in disaggregating the data at the Scottish level compared to the UK level. 
And I noted in your report, uh, and, and uh, I think I'm correct in saying that you weren't able to detect any um, significant correlation between availability and, and, and quality of palliative care with inequality. So there appears to be no difference between um, the, you know, those who are better off and, and worse off in our society in terms of um, availability of palliative care. I wonder, though, if you've noted any regional variation. And what I mean by that is that Scotland is a country with a larger rural population than um, the UK as a whole. And I wonder if there are particular problems in delivering palliative care in rural and remote rural areas, uh, or do we just not have the data to know that? Well, we, it's, it's a fairly weak answer, but we don't have the information. It isn't because data can't be got. It's just that we haven't committed to getting it and to systematically uh, analysing it and, and sifting it over time. Uh, I don't think it's too difficult a job to be done, but we do need a commitment to do it, and, and we need some resources to support that. Uh, I would like us to see us do that, to build up a, a clearer picture of, if you like, the quantum of palliative care that's been delivered, at the very least of specialist palliative care across the country, uh, and what, if any, issues arise there in, in relation to access by not only where you live, but um, your age, uh, your ethnicity, uh, your diagnosis. We, we, we need some more robust data uh, on all of those areas if we're to uh, properly understand uh, how palliative care functions in Scotland. Thank you very much. That's, I mean, you've answered the question and no further questions. Katrina. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Rosa Grant. Um, just a quick question on um, the data and information. Um, it, it seems that the Scottish data is all wrapped up in the UK data and that's quite hard to extrapolate. Why is that given that we've got had different health services for before the Parliament? I, I don't know why I, why that is the case, but when I, I look across the piece, we we have um, some academics who are interested in this issue in Scotland. Um, we don't have a Scottish network or centre for palliative and end of life care studies where those people are working together in a coordinated way and are resourced appropriately. Um, we don't have an end-of-life observatory that's routinely collating information of this kind. Um, we have a relatively small uh, group of people who are doing studies, and many of the studies, important though they are, they're based on small samples and, and local populations, and I've been advocating for a while that we need more population-based data about the need for delivery of palliative care in Scotland. And um, I do have a role in trying to uh, assist the Scottish Government now in the preparation of its strategic framework for action for palliative and end-of-life care. And uh, the Government has already identified this issue of measurement uh, and data uh, as a key one that the strategic framework will have to address. Um, <clears throat> there have been some studies into the availability of palliative care for different conditions. Um, I think it was Macmillan that published a report saying that people with cancer were much more likely to access palliative care than people with other conditions um, towards end of life. How do we, I suppose, make that fairer so that people with all conditions can access palliative care? Well, uh, I think, and I think I hinted at it a bit in the report, that this cancer-non-cancer distinction is becoming more, more blurred now. Um, 10 or 15 years ago, it was quite a stark uh, uh, comparison, and you would find then, as now, that most specialist palliative care services are still predominantly dealing with people with a cancer diagnosis. And for a time, people would say that it was the passport to getting world-class palliative care to have that diagnosis and that those without it were excluded. But the nature of cancer itself is now changing. It's becoming a chronic illness. You might have cancer more than once in your life and you might have other conditions as well. And I think it's uh, that basket of conditions that we should focus on uh, rather than the cancer-non-cancer -cancer, uh, distinction. And in particular, in the context of older people, you have to link it to issues about frailty. Uh, as people live to advanced age. And um, I think there's still a general acceptance that um, 
some of the barriers to accessing palliative care exist in this area and they also relate to age that uh, palliative care has been historically rather better at responding to the needs of people with cancer in the slightly younger age groups and uh, has not been so effective in delivering uh, care to people uh, in advanced old age who may have had cancer but may also have other kinds of problems this could be stroke or heart failure or orthopedic problems um, so I think there's lots of opportunities there for geriatricians, for orthopaedic surgeons and services to um, be uh, brought into the dialogue about their role in palliative care. And I know that in some of our hospitals that there's very good work going on where people are collaborating uh, across specialties uh, in this way. But it's about getting this range and breadth for palliative care rather than the narrow focus of, uh, of intervention. Do you think it's um, to do with patients being able to speak up for themselves. People with cancers who have a terminal diagnosis that is quite rapid are in reasonably good health when they're discussing palliative care and are maybe demanding of those services, whereas elderly people who have maybe been in a much slower decline and um, people with illnesses that are a much slower decline are maybe less able at the time when they actually need intervention to ask for that intervention and should have been doing it earlier. That's right and I think there's a, an issue there about advocacy which is why I've tried to use that uh, study that we did uh, in the uh, Scotland's hospitals uh, as a platform for advocating for older people because what we found in the study was not just that um, uh, 28, 29 percent of all hospital inpatients die within a year, but this figure rises very steeply with age, and particularly for men. So, for the older men, more than 50 percent of those in hospital will die within a year. But they're not necessarily being advocated for. They're not necessarily being signposted for palliative care. Um, and this is where the the uh, uh, involvement of some of these other specialties becomes very, very important. And, of course, the advocacy of the GP, uh, of the social worker and of the nursing team. Thank you. OK, thank you, Rhoda. Um, Colin Keir. Uh, thank you, uh, convener. And first of all, before I uh, ask a question, I'd just like to totally agree with your comments earlier about uh, Dr Derek Doyle, um, who did some remarkable work. I'm not just saying that because I... I know of his work in terms of St Columbus Hospice and uh, ongoing work after that, but uh, also in personal thing, he was, prior to moving on, he was my GP. So <laughs> I'm, I'm absolutely delighted he's getting a degree of recognition here, as if he really is someone who deserves it after his uh, lifelong work in this uh, field. I think uh, you've kind of answered quite a lot of what I wanted to ask uh, through Rhoda Grant's uh, previous question, Mike McKenzie's as well. I really wanted to go back a little bit, and it's just to... Um, we've been dealing, obviously, with... Cancer care is probably the, the most common. It's the most well-known uh, that members of the public will be aware of in terms of palliative care. I was thinking more in terms of the sort of really long-term, slow, degenerative illnesses which seem to pre present a problem in themselves where they are highly, well, depending on the speed of the individual's decline, I suppose, and the difficulties that we have in maintaining or going from the point of ordinary care through to palliative care and the specialisms that are required in, say, looking after someone with, say, Huntington's disease or Parkinson's disease, something along those lines. And... Is there, a, is there a general way that we look after people when we get to palliative care aspects or are there differences which um, would provide difficulties in providing this service throughout the country? Yeah. Well, there are some underlying principles which are probably common across all conditions. Um, principles of good pain and symptom management, good assessment, regular and continuous review, um, multidisciplinary approaches involving other colleagues, uh, attention not just to the patient but to the family and the wider social context. Um, I think all of those are general principles that uh, play out in any context. Um, but there will be disease-specific implications uh, of the kind that you've highlighted. 
um, condition specific. Um, one that you didn't mention was dementia, for example. Um, I think that although we were delighted to, in, in our country to see palliative medicine recognized as a specialty in 1987, that perhaps um, it was a mistake to create a specialty with a full four-year training program uh, of its own. What, what we've seen in other countries, and most notably in the, in the USA, is that um, palliative medicine has become a subspecialty of other medical specializations. So when, uh, rather late in America, uh, palliative medicine was recognized as a specialty, it was of a subspecialty of about a dozen other fields. So the idea being that you first of all trained in um, pediatrics, geriatrics, orthopedics, oncology, uh, uh, in neurological conditions, uh, and then subspecialized for a shorter period in the palliative care of people with those conditions. Uh, so what we're seeing as a result of that is a body of knowledge and expertise building up about the specific palliative care needs, sometimes complex and demanding, as you've indicated, uh, of those with very particular diagnoses, uh, which uh, need to be attended to by uh, people who are caring for those patients uh, in, a, in a specialist context, but who are also practicing these broader principles of palliative care. And at the moment, the, the difficulty has been over a long period of time that most of the focus has been on uh, patients in the oncology setting with a diagnosis of cancer. We, we have got some palliative medicine uh, services that now subspecialize to a degree in looking after the uh, groups that you're describing. But I, I don't think that's the solution to meeting their needs. The, the solution to meeting their needs comes from the specialist services that are already looking after them that need to be more attuned to the palliative care approach. Um, can I maybe ask one final question um, in, in relation to this? I think it's back to where we started and about the definition of palliative care and the discussion about whether it's palliative care specialists or whether we all have a responsibility to offer a degree of palliative care, whether it's family or friends or whether it's care staff come into the home to support someone in their social care needs or whether it's someone in a residential care setting where um, under pressure care staff have to provide a variety of needs perhaps for frail elderly people who may have additional uh, multimorbidities there or it's the nursing home. I'm just trying to tease out wh whether or not as, we, as the Scottish Government develops its palliative care strategy and you're helping and assisting with that and this committee is doing an inquiry into that kind of thing about wh whether you would encourage us to, to look at the full range of social care supports. If someone's got trouble swallowing, just a little bit of help in, in eating might come out, look like a social care support, but, it, but chances are it could be someone in their last year of life as part of palliative care support. So would you urge us to broaden out our inquiry or focus in in relation to specialisms? Definitely the latter. I, I written about this elsewhere and not, not in, in this report, but I, I think that um, there are two facets to palliative care. One is the one that we've tended to dwell on this morning, uh, seen as a kind of medical uh, specialist service, but there's also the notion of palliative care as everybody's business as a public health issue in the wider sense of public health in terms of health promotion, in terms of community assets, uh, community engagement. And I think we have a wonderful opportunity now in, in Scottish society uh, to promote more discussion and involvement in that. And these are things that could uh, be found within the Curriculum for Excellence uh, in, in our schools. We could be uh, engaging some of these issues uh, uh, with our young people. We could be raising more awareness of end-of-life and palliative care needs across many of the subject areas we teach in university. Employers could become more sensitised, trade union members, faith groups, uh, all kinds of community organisations have a part to play in this. And I think there's a will uh, on the part of some of the activists in palliative care in Scotland to, to see more of that and uh, to recognise that the solution to these issues as the Scottish population ages and grows is not going to simply be met within the formal healthcare system and is a, an issue for the whole of society. 
Clark, um, I appreciate and given the nature of, of this discussion, we, we are at our time. I just want to check that none of my MSP colleagues want a, a final question. Um, very, Dennis, yes. Very, thank you. Uh, I'll keep it very brief, uh, Professor. You mentioned uh, at the beginning the work that was going on, I believe it was with Edinburgh University, um, uh, and it, it, is it a tool that they're using to try and assess the need for palliative care, that work that's being done at the moment? Exactly it. It's, a, it's a work on a relatively simple tool that can be used in a lot of different contexts that would identify people who might benefit not necessarily from specialist palliative care but need greater attention given to their palliative care needs by those who are caring for them. Right across all professions, medical, allied health and carers. It's something that could be developed in that way. But I have entered a slight note of caution in my report. We, we saw such a tool uh, developed and rolled out uh, in England and indeed over many, many other countries in the form of the Liverpool Care Pathway. Uh, it wasn't well validated, it wasn't robustly tested, and it ran into major problems. So whilst we're eager to see simple tools widely adopted, we need to invest the time and energy in making sure that they are robust uh, usable and reliable. Sorry, was there not a tool used by um, at Roxburgh House with Grampian um, with the David Carroll consultant at that time uh, looking at how they measure um, the more or less on a daily basis I think it was um, the, the, the patients that they had in the hospice at the time. Well of course that would be a tool used with patients in a specialist setting. What, what's interesting about the SPICT tool is that it's about identifying people wherever they are in the system. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dennis. Uh, Professor Clark, um, both your, your report, your presentation and answering questions have certainly helped this committee with our ongoing inquiry into uh, palliative care. So can I, can I thank you for that? Um, and no doubt we'll, we'll keep the dialogue and communication going. Thank you for the work so far for the committee. That ends agenda item one. I'll just spend briefly as we uh, set up for agenda item two, which is a round table. Thank you, Professor Clark.
Okay, uh, welcome back everyone. We now move to agenda item two, which is the Health, Tobacco, Nicotine, etc. and Care Scotland Bill, um, which is the second item on our ad agenda today, and it's our third evidence session on that piece of legislation. Now, when we do a round table, rather than me welcoming everyone to committee, we just do do a round of introductions. So we'll start from myself and we'll, we'll just head round. Uh, I'm Bob Doris, an MSP for Glasgow, and I'm Deputy Chair of the Health and Sport Committee. Norman. I'm Norman Proven, I'm Associate Director of the Royal College of Nursing in Scotland. Mike McKenzie, MSP, Highlands and Islands Region. I'm Dave Watson, I'm the Head of Campaigns at Unison in Scotland. Uh, good morning, Dennis Robertson, MSP for Aberdeenshire West. Uh, Malcolm Chisholm, MSP for Edinburgh Northern and Leith. Uh, Brenda Knox, uh, Health Improvement Lead, uh, NHS Air Shenarden. Good morning, Colin <laughs> Keir, uh, MSP for Edinburgh Western. Good morning, Councillor Peter Johnson. I'm a West Lothian councillor, but I'm here in my capacity as the Causeway Health and Wellbeing spokesperson. Morning, I'm Beth Hall, and I'm an officer with Causeway. Morning, Richard Lyle, MSP for Central Region. Good morning, I'm Donald Harley. I'm Deputy Secretary of the BMA in Scotland. Rhoda Grant, MSP for the Highlands and Islands. OK, thank you, everyone, and you're most welcome. Now, in a moment, I'm going to ask both Causeway and RCN to give a a brief two-minute uh, statement, which they would requested to do. Um, can I just say before that that there are two main parts of, of this bill, and uh, we have yet to hear evidence in relation to duty of candour and willful neglect. So uh, the presentations, it's in your hands what, what you decide to give the presentations on, of course, of course, the statement on, of course it is, but when we start our questioning, we're going to concentrate on that section of the bill first, and we will, of course, go to... Uh, the, the other section of the of, of the bill and MSP colleagues, uh, we don't have anyone agreed to uh, ask the opening questions, so feel free to catch my eye once you're inspired by these two statements. Once you're inspired by these two statements, Mr Chisholm. Um, OK, can I ask uh, our COSLA representative to go first? Who's doing the opening statement? I'm afraid that? it's me who's joined okay. the first off for this. Peter, on you go. Well, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you this morning. Uh, we would begin by saying as a significant partner in the ongoing campaign to reduce the number of people smoking in Scotland, COSWA has signed up to the existing tobacco control strategy in early 2013. We believe that most of the proposals set out in the bill provide the support needed to keep us aimed firmly at the national targets. The next period we believe will be particularly challenging in regard to the increasing popularity of e-cigarettes, which many people see as a means to help them quit smoking, and we also recognise the risk that their popularity has the potential to undermine our efforts to denormalise smoking. So we support the proposal to allow point-of-sale advertising. Our view is that smokers who wish to use e-cigarettes to help them quit smoking might benefit from point-of-sale advertising. We are concerned about the, the proposal to introduce legislation to ban smoking in hospital grounds. The NHS has only recently, since April 15, uh, extended the smoke-free area to outdoor areas, and local authorities likewise are in the process of doing the same by the end of this year. We believe, therefore, that there's not been sufficient time uh, to look at the, the evidence base that comes from where we are currently before we should be moving to legislation. I'd like to comment um, in respect of the duty of candour and then come on to willful, ne willful neglect. With respect to the other parts of the bill which deal with care, it goes without saying that COSLA fully supports the continuous improvement in relation to quality and safety across health and social care, and we recognise the need for disclosure and remedy of harm. However, we are uncertain as to whether more legislation is absolutely necessary to meet these objectives. We believe this is especially the case in, in relation to the proposed duty of candour. The social care profession has a long history of operating with a culture of openness that supports frank discussion of potential harm and the management of risk within that context. It's not clear to us that a new duty, duty of candour on providers of health or social care is the best or only way of securing a culture of openness and transparency across the newly integrated health and social care systems. Careful consideration of all other avenues of, for achieving this policy intent is, we believe, required. And it may be that securing the desired culture change should be a matter for guidance, training and bespoke improvement support rather than legislation. With regards to the part of the bill dealing with willful neglect, we would like to be clear that COSLA is committed to the principle that the state should take strong action against ill treatment 
or willful neglect, and that people who receive health and social care services should expect to be safe from harm and be supported in an environment which respects their dignity. If we are to realise this policy intent, we believe that careful consideration of the evidence base regarding the most effective means of achieving these aims is required. Should the case be made that new legislation will aid prosecution, enhance deterrence and avoid criminalisation poor practice, then we recommend to our members that we would support the central thrust of the legislation. However, at this point we are concerned that the likely interface between a new offence of willful neglect and a duty of candour could actually produce unintended consequences. For example, while a culture of greater openness and transparency is clearly desirable, the simultaneous introduction of a wider reach in criminal offence of neglect could we believe actually mitigate against that culture. Thank uh, you. Thank you very much, Councillor Johnson. I think if you were in the chamber making that speech, the presiding officer might have cut you short. This certainly does myself when I go over my time, but importantly, you put that on the record. Uh, thank you very much. Norman, is it yourself? That's Indeed, yes. Yeah. Thank you, convener. Good morning, members. Uh, I'm pleased to be here today on behalf of the Royal College of Nursing in Scotland. The RCN is the UK's largest professional association and union for nurses, and we have around 39,000 members in Scotland. Um, as you know, nurses and healthcare support workers make up the majority of those working in the health service in Scotland. I want to state at the start that the RCN would never condone the willful neglect or ill-treatment of a patient. It goes against the very tenets of health and social care professionalism and the ethical duty of care that our members have towards their patients. We do, however, have serious concerns that the proposals in Section 3 of the Bill will undermine efforts to encourage greater openness in healthcare professionals and organisations when something goes wrong. We also remain unconvinced that the wide range of sanctions which already exist are inadequate. There is no evidence that individuals or organisations are failing to be held to account when there are any failings in health or care delivery. We are concerned that the threat of criminal proceedings against individuals will be counterproductive to building a culture of transparency, learning and improvement within the NHS and indeed inside, outside the NHS. It is key for patient safety. I will leave my remarks there and I look forward to exploring the issue further today. Um, thank you very much for that, uh, Mr Proven. Now, I asked uh, members to catch my eye, and it's very effective because uh, Malcolm Chisholm has been waving at me for the last few minutes. So I think the opening question will be from Malcolm Chisholm. Oh, well, well I, 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 I know that we want to start with the duty of candour and offence of willful neglect, and I, I really found the submissions really interested in that, and I suppose particularly the contrast between um, the BMA and the RCN on the one hand and Unison on the other. So... Obviously, we want to hear um, from uh, for even more from the RCN and also from the BME about their problems about that. But I suppose, by contrast, Unison seem to be uh, supportive of both. And I, I, I think, and I, I suppose, the other dimension of this that's quite interesting to me is to what extent we're talking about organisations and to what extent we're talking about individuals, because it looks as if Unison is certainly emphasising the organisational side of this, although presumably the offence of willful neglect will apply to individuals as well as organisations. But I think it would be very useful, the committee, if we could just draw out and try and establish the reasons why Unison, obviously a major health union, is supportive. Well, the other two health unions, if the BMA wants to, is, 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 allows me to call them a union, uh, are very much against them. Um, now, now, I think because uh, Donald Harley caught my eye initially. I think, Donald, it's useful for you to come in and, and say a few words on that and maybe followed by <coughs> Dave, Dave Watson after that. Donald, okay. do you want to come Just a, a, a very short position which might help clarify for Malcolm and, and other members around the table and good morning to all. Um, so, as you'd expect, the BMA naturally supports the principles of uh, openness, honesty and transparency in uh, NHS Scotland and the, and the broad principles of person-centred safe care, which lie behind the proposals in parts two and three of the bill. But as you've, you've rightly noted, we do have concerns about some of the specific proposals and um, whether there's actually a need for legislation in, in these areas at all. And as uh, has been noted, really, the, um, there's a bit of a contradiction between the new, uh, proposed new offence of willful neglect and ill treatment with the duty of candor provisions, uh, with the two working against each other, also working against uh, the very important culture of openness and transparency that needs to lie at the heart uh, of the NHS, which is something we need to build and sustain. 
I think we'd also be con uh, concerned that there's a potential for uh, adverse impact on clinical decision making and whether that leads to uh, a risk avoidance at, at the margins of uh, clinical practice. And, uh, but fundamentally, if uh, people have undue concern about consequences, whether they're going to be open to sharing information within the organisations across the NHS and helping build a learning, developing NHS that I think we'd um, all want to see. And um, lastly, I think we would fundamentally need some clarity on how the apologies given under this legislation would work in practice with the UK-wide GMC standards and investigatory processes, because it's not clear to our members whether uh, the safeguards with it within the bill would satisfy uh, the GMC at a UK level. And I guess the same would be true for the Nursing and Midwifery Council, but uh, the RCN may wish to speak to that as well. Uh, uh, Mr Harley, um, I, I'm going to bring uh, Dave Watson in a second, but I'm still not sure where you stand on the duty of candour um, after all of that. So are you broadly supportive of it, but you want to double-check whether there's enough safeguards um, because it, it, it aligns with professional standards requirements at the moment in terms of well, duties, doesn't it? You, you're, you're absolutely right. There, there, there are professional duties both within the GMC and within the Nursing Midwifery Council that, that uh, uh, make that incumbent uh, upon uh, health professionals. So there's, there's just a real question mark about whether legislation's required uh, on, on top of that and whether there's, uh, it creates an imposition of bureaucracy uh, which would bear down on the NHS at a time when we know that services are under real financial pressure and whether we, we, want, we want to add to administrative costs in the system when we know that every penny is needed for frontline care. But I suppose, I, I apologise, Malcolm, because I know it's your, your opening question, but I, I, I suppose a s consistent reporting and use of a duty of candour across all health professionals via the health board would be a positive thing? In principle, I think it depends on how it's applied. Okay. I wasn't trying to lead you there. I'm just trying to establish mm -hmm. where, where the BMA is sitting. Um, Dave, do you want to explain? Yes, yeah, thanks, Convener. Um, uh, as Mark says, we are broadly supportive of the bill. I mean, we do say both in our evidence and in the um, submissions we made at the consultation stage that we do have, we share a lot of the concerns about the bill, about costs, workload, training, that there is some conflict between um, employment contracts and uh, regulatory, and there is the potential, at least, for unintended consequences in term, terms of care. <coughs> Well, Bans, we also recognise um, that the current system is weak in places, there is inconsistency of approach, and in some places, reluctance to candour. I suppose if there's a difference, um, I suppose in terms of the NHS, I think the evidence for legislation is probably thinner than it is in the social care area, and obviously we also represent large numbers of members in the social care field. Uh, and as you will be aware, we've made the point, particularly about the introduction of commercial pressures into social care. In our report, time to care. Um, we, we set out the concerns of frontline staff uh, who explain some of those commercial pressures, uh, be that they work for commercial organisations or voluntary sector because there are contracts in place. Uh, you may have seen recently an employment tribunal case where uh, a care manager reported in, in, that, in that case that she was told by her, her company to accept care packages even though she had no staff to deliver them. And I think all of these reflect some of the experiences we have. In that time for care report, I did um, uh, highlight, I did some of the focus groups myself, you know, staff who were clearly unwilling to report uh, not just safety violations, but care abuse as well. Yeah. So there is an issue, I think, particularly in the social care sector around that. Now, our view, therefore, is that, has always been, and that there's, there's an issue about consistency from our approach here, that we believe that legislation can drive culture change. It doesn't do so on its own. You need organisation support and, uh, and other things as well. Um, and I think uh, the evidence for that is take drink driving, smoking in enclosed places. Uh, of course, we've also argued the same point in relation to violence to staff. And I think if we've got a criticism, it's the Scottish Government hasn't been consistent there. It says we need legislation here, but rejected legislation when it came to dealing with violence to staff, which we again be believed would, uh, would drive culture change. 
And Malcolm is also correct is that whilst there are a range of the, the, the important point for us in this is that the duty both in candor and certainly in the willful, willful neglect and ill treatment uh, sections put emphasis on organisations as well. Uh, that there's a real risk with this type of legislation organised simply scapegoat staff uh, and we think the emphasis on organisations as long as that's backed up in the guidance the training uh, and in the regulations uh, will be helpful to changing the culture as we th we believe it needs to be okay thank you very much mr watson uh, uh, malcolm do you want to come back in and well um i suppose another dimension i don't know whether these um laws have been applied uh long enough in England or whether they're significantly different, but I wonder if any of the evidence from England, is, is there any evidence from England? I think these two things are in legislation, perhaps not in the same form in England, and I wonder if there's any evidence that would back up either side of that debate from England, or is, it, or is the legislation too different to, to, be, to be helpful? I, I don't think it's too, too different. Uh, it's just, I think, too early. There's no, no work being done. We haven't done surveys on our own members yet to see whether it's had any impact. Okay. Anyone else be able to draw in examples from England as, as Malcolm was, was referring to? Okay. Rhoda, do you want to take the the discussion on? Yes. I, um, I should I should put on record that I'm a Unison member as in my register of interest. I was interested in the what Unison were saying about um, their disappointment about this covering only adult health and social care and that it should be extended to young people and wanting to hear other people's views on that and why they may th why they think that the government has left out young people because they're a particularly vulnerable group as well. Okay. Um, yeah, well, only because you just recently will come back to you, Dave, absolutely, but uh, Councillor Johnson will take, take On the particular there. issue about we were just discussing. Um, I think um, we would support that, given that get, support the inclusion of children's services, given that a number of health and care partnerships, for example, are already looking to include children's services and go beyond the minimum requirement of having adult social care services included. And given that children live in families, um, it seems a bit strange that the legislation would cover adults in the family and not children. Um, so we would certainly, I think, take the view that children's services and the whole range of integrated services, if there is going to be legislation, should be covered. Okay. Uh, Mr Watson, do you want to...? Yes, I mean, I think we, we feel, as, as, as in the act earlier, that there's a need for a consistent approach here. Uh, I think I understand, in fairness, why it hasn't come necessarily straight away in this legislation. I think there is a, a complex, different range of other legislation that applies to children's services, particularly ch protection of children. Uh, and I think, therefore, there is a need to work out how the two things match together. We don't want a conflict of laws so that staff don't know which they're supposed to be operating. So what we'd like to see is uh, a careful look at that uh, and then ensure that we have a consistent approach about, uh, across all care areas. Okay, and I just want to add to that, Come in. I've never such a passive set of witnesses um, in, in, in my time. Uh, and I'll give Rhoda the opportunity first because it was her question. Rhoda, do you want to come back? No, that, that, that clarifies okay. for me. Dennis. Uh, uh, thank you, Kavina. It's really just to pursue uh, it's a wee bit at, at the moment. <clears throat> The witnesses feel that, in, in some instances, the regulations that are there, say, within social work and the uh, policies and procedures that exist, is sufficient at the moment. Um, and they themselves could, maybe through just guidance, be improved on rather than going down this legislative route. Uh, and I'm just wondering, you know, we had the, the Medical Act 1983 uh, for, for our doctors, and I'm just wondering, is it something like that, to some extent, that could be rolled out and embraced, which would cover the, the broader spectrum within the, the health sector? Um, but I'm sure with the SSSC, the guidance that they have within the care sector, you know, their guidance, is it something that we should ask them to look at to ensure that that's taken forward and obviously it's robust enough without imposing legislation. Um, Norman Proven, did you want to comment on that? Yes, um, we feel at the moment there is enough legislation to deal with us, both the regulatory legislation through the GMC and the NMC and other places that can take hold professionals to account for the behaviours that they have. Also in common law, assault and the, the 
the judicial system in Scotland can deal with that. And we also have the Protecting Vulnerable Groups legislation, which is slowly becoming embedded into the system. And our view is that you don't need additional legislation at that point for the specific claim of willful neglect. There is enough in the system to deal with that at the moment. And if I could illustrate that with a point, obviously there are people who are already covered under the Mental Health Act in relation to willful neglect. And the Royal College of Nursing at the moment is handling somewhere in the region of 600 cases across the whole spectrum of services that we provide, employment, personal injury, um, regulatory work. And at the moment we are dealing with just two cases that are that, that, that constitute where someone might have been accused of neglect. So my question would be, with the legislation that we have in place, do we need another layer of legislation here? Okay, thank you, Norman. Donald Harley, did you want to come in on that? Yes. Thank you, uh, convener. Um, <clears throat> yeah, just to follow up on the point about about the, uh, the the medical acts. I mean, clearly the provisions that the GMC makes for doctors are very onerous indeed. And, and, and uh, as you uh, you'll be aware that um, in many instances, uh, when when doctors are under investigation, they can be uh, career limiting or career ending. So that the the, um, the, reg the regulatory mechanism there has real teeth and, and we see it on a daily basis um in fact perhaps it's, it's strange really that there's nobody here from the the gmc to act as as a witness to to give account to uh to that but uh i mean certainly in uh there have been well publicized cases in in aberdeen recently for example um where where that's uh, been been seen in um in in operation so there, there are no doubts that the the system is is working, and uh, there are strong duties on on all medical uh, practitioners to uh, to adhere to the standards in place and to account for themselves if they don't, to the extent of losing their career. There are duties on other medical practitioners to report poor practice whenever and wherever they see it. Um, so I have um, no hesitation in saying that we we believe that, that there are strong systems in place already. Further legislation is not needed. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Harley. Uh, Beth Hall. Thanks. It's maybe just to pick up on some of the points that Mr. Proven was making, and to agree um, that the problem is not lack of legislation. We we have a, a huge amount of legislation in place, especially in relation to um, the social care field, where we have Adult Support and Protection Acts, we have Adults with Incapacity, various pieces of mental health legislation that that have been mentioned. Um, so the problem is not lack of legislation. Um, the problem is lack of investment in, in social care um, and what we need to see is better leadership, better training, um, a culture shift and layering more legislation on top is, is not the way to achieve that. Okay, thank you. Um, now, can I um, maybe just um, move, the, move this on a bit? Malcolm, was it on this specifically you yeah, wanted to... No, I'm, I'm really just trying to, to trying to understand in my own mind why there is such disagreement on this. I mean, I wonder whether the problem is, I mean, I think in a kind of way, the fact that it's in mental health legislation almost becomes an argument for extending it to other spheres. But I mean, is, is the issue not that ill treatment and willful neglect is actually going to be, it's quite a serious, severe, limited category. And, and, and yet the arguments against it seem to be more straying into the area. We all know that in terms of errors and mistakes that people make, we must have a a no-blame culture where we can learn and improve. But it, to me, there's like two separate things and they're getting confused because, I mean, ill-treatment and willful neglect is very much the extreme end of it. And I don't think that's going to impact on this culture of improvement that we want, no-blame culture of improvement. And it seems to me the two, um, at least that's, that's the question I have in my head at the moment, whether the RCN and the BMA are actually confusing those two categories uh, and again I go back to the point it's in mental health legislation obviously I have to declare an interest in that having been involved in it but uh, you know the fact that it's there to me becomes an argument for putting it into other spheres as well. Well the question in your head certainly got the reaction from one or two of our witnesses but can I just tack on to that because what Malcolm's talking about is the major and significant end of the spectrum in terms of duty of candor and willful neglect that, that's the point you were making there's a list of of, of triggers within the bill which maybe when you talk about your answer to Malcolm you might want to refer to whether you think irrespective of whether you agree with the duty of candor or not whether you think the triggers are appropriate because we're scrutinizing this legislation not just based on whether it's needed but also the content 
within the bill. And just for clarity, the bill would uh, propose that where a person experiences an unintended or unexpected incident during their care, which results or could have resulted in death or harm, the health or social care organisation would be required to implement the duty of candor procedure. And the triggers, as I'm sure you know, would be if death could have happened, severe harm. Um, I'll go through one or two more, but I'll read them all out. Pain or psychological harm lasting at least 20 continuous days of the person requires treatment by a doctor to prevent their death or any of the other outcomes above. So there's a cluster of triggers there, if you would like. So if you could deal with Malcolm's question, try to tease out why there's this resistance to to, to having this, uh, despite the fact it's quite at the extreme or major end of the spectrum, but also in the mechanics of the legislation as well. Have we have we got that balance right now? I've, 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 Beth Hall's caught my eye, as has Dave Watson. Yeah, Beth, you want to go in first? Yeah, um, I think there's there's two questions there, maybe just to deal with the, the first one around the interface between the, the two pieces of legislation. Um, now, I recognise that um, willful neglect would be at, at very much at the extreme end of the spectrum, but I think some of the concerns are around how would that operate in practice and how would that be perceived by staff members um, at the front line? So... For example, um, if I was working in, in a social care setting um, and I witnessed something going wrong or something went wrong because of my actions, um, the question is, would I be more or less likely to be open about that or indeed to whistleblow if the consequences are potentially now much, much more serious? Um, so if I decide to whistleblow on a colleague, it's no longer about whether they're going to lose their job or not. In my mind, um, I might now be questioning whether that could lead to, to criminal charges. And I think the, the worry is that, that the, the interface between these two could actually um, mitigate against that, that culture of openness. Um, and I think for, for all of us sitting here in, in this room, it's easy for us to say, well, no, willful neglect would be right up at the tight end, it would be defined this way, etc. Um, but I actually asked someone working in social care the other day who was telling me a story about how she recently whistle blew on someone, whether she would have made a different decision or whether it would have given her pause if there was this, this new, fence in, uh, new, new offence um, in place. And her answer to that was yes, she may have acted differently. So... Um, that, that's the, the first point. Um, the second point around um, the triggers um, for the duty of candour, um, I think, yes, we, we do have some concerns around them, especially in relation to pain and psychological harm. That can be quite difficult to define, especially if you're dealing with someone who lacks capacity. Um, so I think the concern there is you, you could have either at the one extreme a lot of trigger events or at the other extreme that being insufficiently understood to, to be able to achieve what it sets out to. Um, so in thinking that through how it might affect the health and social care system, um, I think we had originally been concerned that some of those triggers um, could actually be covered under delayed discharge. You could see a delayed discharge leading to those circumstances and what we would now be doing is layering another another layer of bureaucracy across the top of that process, um, which, could, which is the last thing that you want to do when you're trying to facilitate um, smooth and speedy discharge from hospital. OK, thank you for that. Uh, Dave Watts? Yeah. I mean, I think uh, no-one's disputing that there is a, a lot of legislation uh, at, at the moment, but we also accept, that, as our, our report shows, and this, these are hundreds, in fact, several thousand responses to our survey and the focus groups from frontline staff who are, who are giving care in a range of settings at present. What was clear from there, that a number of people had seen events that you would expect them to declare to a duty of candour, uh, and in some cases, um, um, matters that would have come under the Part 3 uh, requirements as well, and they are not doing so at present. So clearly there is, a, there is an issue in, in that. Uh, for me, the, 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 the important point here is that the, the current range of rules don't really bear down on organisations and, importantly, the controlling voice of those organisations, the directors and others, managers, um, and in fairness to them, they're put under, in some cases, very big commercial pressures uh, to do so. That's why um, uh, the, we find too many cases where organisations choose to scapegoat the front frontline staff. Uh, for what's happening in those organisations rather than accepting it's the policy of those organisations chasing work that they haven't got the resources to deliver uh, or asking staff to deliver care without sufficient time to do so. I think 
particularly helpful, we thought, was uh, in, the, um, uh, in, in part three, is the powers from remedial orders and publicity orders. Uh, we felt that, and, and I like, also like the, the, the ability of the prosecutor to appeal against the failure to use those as well. Uh, I think what that does do is put a focus on the controlling voice of organisations that they're not exempt. They can't just pass the buck every time. If there are failings in the organisation, then that organisation could be criminally responsible as well. Well, so I think that will put a real, it's a bit like um, culpable homicide and other, other, other examples where we have argued in the past uh, that there's a need to put some responsibility on the controlling minds of, of organisations. Now, it may or may not work, but I think uh, that is one of the ways this legislation does shift in a different direction. Thank you. Norman yeah, I, I had indicated earlier that the Royal College of Nursing is currently handling about 600 cases. That's not unusual. I've been in post seven years, and in the seven years I've been in post, not once has the legislation protecting mental health people been used for any of the cases. So there's very, very low usage of the legislation that's currently out there, and that's one of the reasons why I don't think it needs to be extended to the adult population. One of our major concerns here is that the thrust of the bill, that Part 3 might nullify Part 2, what we require here is, yes, a duty of candour. We want organisations to have an improvement methodology where when things go wrong, they're openly, transparently examined and patients are advised of those. My fear is that by introducing the potential for criminal offence that you're going to nullify people's confidence to come forward and take part in the duty of candour. That's the first thing. The second thing, I'd like to build on a point that Dave made. By illustrating with an example, one of my staff occasionally works bank nursing shifts to remain connected with the clinical um, profession that he chose before he came to work for the Royal College of Nursing. He was booked to do a shift in a NHS hospital in the NHS in Scotland. I won't name the board. And when he turned up for his 12-hour shift, he was advised that the other trained nurse who was due to be on duty with him had phoned in sick, and therefore he would be the only trained nurse on, on shift. The three... Um, care assistants that would be working with them were all bank workers. Not a single person on that 12-hour shift in that hospital ward knew any of the patients in that ward or the routine. He immediately felt that the risks for him as a professional registrant were too great. He advised the manager who had made the decision and was told there was no additional resources that could be employed to help him. He was also told that the ward next door, the nurse in charge, was not competent to do intravenous drugs and he would have to go and do the drug round in the ward next door as well during this 12-hour shift. It wasn't until he identified himself as a full-time member of the Royal College of Nursing and insisted about the risks that he felt he was being placed under that additional resources were given. My concern is, if that had been a nurse who hadn't worked for the Royal College of Nursing and didn't have the confidence to robustly challenge that, had worked that shift and made an error, who would have been held accountable? It would have been him as an individual registrant and not the non-clinical manager who was initially making the decision to employ no additional resources. That is the risk. If something had went wrong, in my experience, it is the person who is delivering the care that's held to account. And under those circumstances of this bill in relation to willful neglect, it would have been that nurse and not the organisation that was held to account. And that feels wrong. Uh, uh, Donald will bring you in in a moment because I think that, that was quite a good example which links in quite nicely to the point Dave Watson was making about where there are systems failures and the workforce on the ground feeling that they could be culpable for what uh, for, for the, the systems failures. Mr Proven, just, just in, 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 in relation to that, who would have been the systems person that in theory would have been responsible for that? Would it have been the, the nurse coordinator for the, the health board or for that particular nursing discipline within the health board? Um, maybe give a little bit more information on that and then tease yeah. out where you feel, if you like, the buck should stop or the improvement should, yeah. should kick in. It very much varies from board to board. The clinical structures and boards are not the same in every board in Scotland. The example that I gave was a weekend shift when there wasn't any professional nurse on. So the decision was being made by somebody in a general management position who had no clinical background and wasn't qualified to assess the risk. They would just start, and they were equally under pressure of having no additional resources that they could that they could immediately move. From a clinical perspective, the nurse in charge of that ward would have been responsible for the decisions had he continued to take on that shift and work without any additional resources. That's a professional decision that they're making based on their assessment of the risk. Technically, 
the director of nursing arguably could be the person who's responsible for the quality of care right the way through a system. But providing care 24-7, um, it's impossible for that person always to be cited or to be available. And in my experience of the cases that we have where there are care failures, there are very, very small number of occasions where it's actually just the, the interventions or the actions of an individual nurse it's more often systematic examples like the one that I have just described to you that have added risk for that individual. But inevitably, inevitably, it is the individual registrant who's eventually held to account. Right, and I appreciate you expanding on that because I think that's something we'll have to grapple with as a committee in relation to where the culpability sits when, yeah. if and when th this is passed. Uh, Donald, my apologies. Donald Harley, you wanted to come in that, on this. That's all right. Uh, I think I'm probably going to end up echoing Norman and Dave to some, to some extent. Um, the point was previously made, though, that these sanctions are all at the, at the extreme end of uh, what happens on a day-to-day -day basis. And, 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 and that really just speaks to me about the fact that, that that's where the existing criminal, civil and professional sanctions come into play. And I haven't really seen any evidence as to why they would not be appropriate or don't work. And without that evidence, it's difficult to argue that there's a case to change. In terms of the concepts of ill treatment or willful neglect, we have a concern. We have two concerns around those. They're not particularly well defined, um, but also, and just picking up on the point that Norman was 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 making there, how many of these issues, and we, and we saw it in in, in, in uh, the Francis report and all the rest of it, how many of these issues are down to people being overstretched and put under pressure and are organisational failings. And Dave mentioned that um, when these th things come out, people are, are held up as scapegoats and, and, and put to blame uh, of it within the existing arrangements within organisations. I suppose there has to be a worry that, that, that if criminal sanctions uh, are, uh, are applied uh, following this legislation, that they would then be the victims of that as much as the organisational uh, sanctions. So it would be an even worse wrong committed on uh, healthcare uh, staff. Um, so, uh, but but fun, fun, fundamentally, uh, I, I, I think we, 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 we are uh, worried this makes things worse for staff trying to do their duties in difficult circumstances, and it works against the abilities of organisations to learn and develop and adopt that openness and candour that we that's talked about in part two. I think um, what has been quite clear in terms of making sure there's safeguards and no unintended consequences in terms of, of, of the legislation, and that's been quite helpful when we look at um, our evidence. I want to take us through more, more of the details of the bill, but Malcolm, do you want to come back in because you asked the initial question? In no, that's very helpful. That's that. no. Okay. Now, I'm, I'm going to specifically look at the, the duty of candour because the procedure would be triggered when in the opinion of a health professional not involved in the person's care the incident resulted or could result in death or harm so it's the idea of that person being an independent health professional there may be a variance of views that if this legislation goes forward should that be an independent person is that the most appropriate way to do it or would it actually conversely be more helpful if it's someone who could contextualise what had happened uh, in relation to whatever that incident was. So we're scrutinised the nuts and bolts of this piece of legislation, not just the principles behind it. So do witnesses have any comments to help us in our deliberations in relation to whether that's been an independent health professional and how that might operate? No takers on that. We're all happy with that. Oh, we're, oh, as soon as I said, are we all happy with that? Two hands go up. Uh, let's take Donald Harley first this time. Yeah, uh, well, just, just to build very slightly and briefly on the point I was making before about being careful, it doesn't become a, a burden on the system uh, at this particular point in time. But for, from our particular point of view, we'd be particularly worried about uh, general practices, which, as you know, are uh, essentially very small organisations, and it, 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 the worry that would be that it would provide a disproportionate uh, burden on them. Uh, and as I'm sure the committee is well aware, general practice is under great strain uh, at the moment. There have been a number of publicised cases of uh, practices being unable to continue. Um, so uh, we, we wouldn't want to see any, any more unnecessary and undue burdens placed upon them. Okay, um, Norman, 
Yeah, I, I think in, in the sense of this, you need a bit of both, particularly when the bill's looking at near misses rather than actual events. You're going to require staff who are close to the patient that witness something that could result in harm reporting them. So in the first instance, you need a robust mechanism for staff to be able to raise concerns. In the situation where a third party is then the person who looks at that incident in some detail, that can be quite helpful to have somebody who's emotionally removed from the incident to look at it in an independent way. Um, from our perspective, we have, in the, the consultation response that we wrote, made it quite clear that it will require the boards to train people to a high level to do this type of intervention, to look objectively at an incident and properly describe it for the board so that decisions can be made. So staff need to be supported and properly trained to undertake that role and we wouldn't have any objection to that being a third party if that was appropriate but it would have to, in the first instance, be absolutely acknowledged that some of those near misses would have to be identified close to the patient by the people involved directly in their care and reported to the board for them to fulfil that function. Can I ask maybe how some some of the witnesses would feel because it, it, it is down in the bill I understand it's a healthcare professional but this could happen in a social care setting where most of the the, the staff are you know are, are, are involved in the co-face providing day-to-day -day social care so is that appropriate that it should remain a healthcare professional are you content with that or does it matter I don't know I'm not trying to draw you in here Mr that's Watson that's but I just wonder if you have a comment on that uh, no I mean I, I mean obviously we've only got the outline in the bill that, that the, these matters as we covered by by rate by regulation it wasn't clear to me in reading it how this would apply certainly in the social care setting um, frankly it's not entirely clear I mean necessarily might apply in some health community care settings as well it's it's a very easy model to see how it might work in a hospital uh, how it might work even in a in a in a resident in the residential setting but it's not entirely clear to me how it would work there so i think you know it would be interesting to see, and I, I couldn't see anything in the uh, policy memorandum which explained either how, how, how the government felt that this would apply in social care settings. Okay. Uh, well, Beth Hall um, and then Peter Johnson, and we'll take you in after that, Norman. You can both speak if you want. It's up to you. Hopefully we'll be saying the same thing. Okay. <laughs> Beth, you go first. Um, I, I think this is a very difficult one to, to answer. For, firstly, the... I would say in terms of it being a healthcare professional every time, no, I, I don't think that that, that would be appropriate. Um, in terms of what would be appropriate, it's, it's very difficult to call. And I think partially that is because the issues are very complex. They're complex, especially when you're dealing with people who lack capacity, where perhaps the staff members, it's only the staff members closest to that person that would perhaps be capable of, of identifying um, things in, in the first place. Um, I'm sorry that I'm not giving any proposed solution here, and I, I think um, these difficulties lie under our nervousness um, around legislating. I think as soon as you try to legislate for these circumstances, you, you arrive at an, a very imperfect solution. Okay, um, thank you very much, Ben. Yeah, uh, I mean, Peter, do example, you want to add to that? Yeah. We, we already have examples of integrated services, such as REACT in West Lothian, where you have medical staff, social care staff, all working in someone's home at the same time, delivering a package of care. Um, it would be very difficult, I think, to have legislation that would focus on a healthcare worker, part of a part of a, an integrated team, and, and not deal with the whole team. And I think that's just an example of why we consider, as, as Beth has said, that it's very difficult to promote legislation that can actually deal with this. And, and our view is that it's much better if you're dealing with this issue through um, improvement and a culture of, of openness and transparency. Thank you very much, Councillor Johnson. Uh, Norman Proven? Yeah, j just very briefly, I, th I think, convener, you make a very fair point. The traditional boundaries between healthcare and social care services are becoming increasingly blurred, and, in fact, staff are working in a more integrated way, and that's the policy direction in Scotland. So I do wonder who, then, would have the responsibility um, for a duty of candour disclosure in these circumstances? Would it be the health board... Would it be the local council? Would it be the integrated joint boards, this new entity that's coming along? And I'm not sure that that's sufficiently covered here, and it's a fair point that it would have to be absolutely explicit whose responsibility it was to pick up a case determined presumably by the environment in which the, the incident happened. OK, 
Okay, thank you. Now, there's, there, there's one more question we're, we're, we're going to ask in this section of the bill, and what I'm really doing is giving Richard Lyle a heads up, who's going to take us on to the next section of the bill shortly. Okay, Mr Lyle. Um, we've already spoken a little bit about what the definition of willful neglect or ill treatment should be, or how broadly defined would it be, and that, that's not as clear as yet. And in the evidence, uh, some people question whether ill treatment could uh, include genuine errors, perhaps drug errors, for example, m m Mr Pro Proven, uh, um, or uh, Mr Watson was referring to, could it be a resource allocation issue? So maybe just your opportunity to put on the record um, how you think, I mean, l let's work on the basis that this goes through the legislative process and becomes law. How would you like to see willful neglect or ill treatment Deter defined, or what kind of safeguards would you like to have within that? So this would be your opportunity to put some of that on the record to help us in more stage one deliberations. Any takers in relation to that? Mr Proven? Yes. The, the notion of genuine error being considered as willful neglect just seem, seems quite astonishing to me. We require a culture where when mistakes are made that people can learn from them. The, the example that you gave of drug error Drug errors do happen, but not because people are neglectful, because mistakes happen, and genuine mistakes can happen. I remember having a discussion with a, a manager in a health board in Scotland after a drug error by a nurse, and I pointed out that that nurse in a busy medical ward will perhaps have 30 patients with comorbidity, given six or seven dispensing actions to each of those patients um, twice or three times a day, hundreds of thousands over the course of a year, millions over the course of their career, the chance of them never making one simple error are fairly remote. And the principle that they could be criminalised for a simple error rather than an improvement strategy put in seems to me that it will drive errors underground. People will not be honest and open about when, it, when errors happen for the fear of the impact they could have in their career rather than having a... Uh, a, a real environment where improvement drove error reduction. Um, I, I'm sorry now I gave that as an example um, um, <laughs> a, a, of a drug error. I, I was hopefully trying to give the suggestion that that's the kind of thing that hopefully wouldn't be captured within willful neglect. I don't think there's any suggestion that, that, that it would be. In I, I would suggest yeah. that if you look at fairly major care failures like Winterbourne View, the learning disability example that was on Panorama, where people are shown to act in a way that's cruel towards people, that is a premeditated decision that somebody has made to act in a way that's unreasonable. I would regard that potentially as willful neglect rather than error. Yeah, I think I think that's perhaps what yeah. I was trying to tease out tease out the the, the question. I, I wouldn't want to run through a list of. I know a drug error is not trivial, but in relation to some of the large things that willful neglect could capture. It would it would be it would be the lower end. Um, I'm trying to tease out where you think that the willful neglect should sit in terms of the kind of things that would be captured. And thank yeah. you for for pointing that out. I don't know if anyone else wants to add to that before we move on. Beth Hall. Um, yeah. Um, I think I would have to agree that we need a very tight um, definition of willful neglect so that we avoid um, criminalising behaviours where people would otherwise have been censured for, for poor practice. It's not that there would have been no action, um, but, but it would have been of a lower order. Um, I think something that we haven't touched on in terms of the, the definition of, of willful neglect up till now um, is the scope and the settings that it would apply in. Um, I think the, the bill seems to suggest that it would be in formal care settings, um, so it needs to be clear whether that would apply to someone's home or not. I'm thinking of people receiving um, social care at home. Um, I would suggest if the bill does go ahead, then it would need to apply to, to those settings too. Um, also, the bill uses the language of care worker, um, but there's no clear definition um, around what that would mean. I would take that to mean paid staff. Um, so therefore, there's the question of, um, does it apply to familial care? More and more we're seeing family members providing significant amounts of care um, for people, especially in, in relation to social care. Um, now, under some circumstances, albeit exceptional circumstances, family members can actually be employed as personal assistants under the Self-Directed Support Act. Um, and we would suggest that in those circumstances, um, the definition of care worker should apply to those people um, and that the offence of, of willful neglect to the scope should include that. Thank you very much, Bethel. Now, 
I'll take other witnesses in in a second, but because we are moving on shortly to the next section, Dennis Robertson wanted to come in, so I'll take Dennis first so you uh, can actually, mop up uh, what Beth, Dennis's comments are. Beth more or less covered the, 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 the issue I was going to raise. But my understanding is, and perhaps um, Mr Provan could or uh, maybe take me through this, is it not the, the, the situation at the moment where a mistake uh, happens and it's recognised and, and say death does result, that it is investigated and if there were to be circumstances where there was suspicion around and perhaps willful neglect during that care, that would be brought to the attention anyway of, of um, the profession. And could it not then result in criminal proceedings? But yeah, yeah, yeah. And just, just because, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to bring in Mr Proven, but ju just to give it a note, because I do want to cover the first part of the bill. Yeah. Uh, if you could answer that, Mr Proven, and then Dave Watson and Donald Harley's <laughs> indicated they wish to make some additional comments, and we'll move on at that point. Richard, OK, and we'll, we'll take you in. So, Norman? Yeah, I'll be brief. Yes, there are indeed systems in place where errors happen for those to be appropriately investigated. Um, both within uh, boards and other other places where care is provided, and then should fault be found, um, nurses, for example, could be reported to the NMC and removed from the register if they were unfit to practice. And the, the Protecting Vulnerable Groups legislation can bar people from working with adults or for children, or indeed both, if it's felt that they can't provide good care. And that goes back to the initial point I made, that I don't think we need additional legislation. I think both through regulatory and the law as it stands just now, there is enough to be able to sanction people without without any additional legislation around willful neglect. Okay, thank you, Mr. Proven. Dave Watson. Yeah, I, I, I was going to make this broad, the same point that um, the Beth made about uh, self-directed care. I think there is it's 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 there are some vaguenesses in part two of the act. Obviously, it talks about volunteers, but only volunteers who essentially are controlled by an organisation. I think there's some let, lack of clarity there. There's even less clarity in relation to to part three. So I think uh, with the growth of personalisation, the self-directed care, I think we do need to be clear there, particularly when some of the registration uh, provisions at the moment don't always cover every form of care in, in that area as well. So I think it is important that we, we keep up to date with, with current practice. I think in relation to ill treatment and willful neglect, you know, they are words on the, on the face of it. I think it's very important that uh, prosecutors in particular uh, understand what the mens rea of the offence would be in terms of, of criminal, criminal law. And I think it's also important, increasingly in Scots law, we are following European practice of a purpose of a approach to legislation so I think if I was the judge in, in, in a case I'd be wanting to know what the ill that Parliament felt needed to be cured here so I think it would be helpful as you tease out the bill and get further evidence uh, if that is clarified so that you know when guidance and others issues on this that we can refer to the ill that you were seeking to correct in passing this this legislation. Thank you very much, Mr Watson. On this section, uh, Mr Harley will we'll give you the last word and then we'll move on. Thank you very much. Very briefly. Um, I suppose what would worry us is uh, that neglect is a symptom of systemic failings, of a system under overstretch. And if people perhaps sometimes receive less care than they might or less good quality care than they might because healthcare <laughs> practitioners, whether they be nurses, doctors, healthcare assistants... Uh, social care workers, call it what you will, are running from pillar to post and have to prioritise. They haven't necessarily given everything that best practice might require in a given situation. That, that then might be deemed to be neglect, and then those individuals are paying the price of the systemic failings, and that was what must fundamentally be safeguarded against in uh, any legislation going forward. Okay, thank you very much, Mr Harley. And that changed very much with what uh, Mr Watson was saying earlier on in his evidence, and we'll, we'll look at that carefully. You've waited a long time, Richard, for to come in with your question, but uh, uh, Richard Lyle, MSP. Thank you, convener. I actually have two questions, uh, but I'll try and, um, and contain it. Um, we heard last week from the advertising agency and also from one of the manufacturers that advertising on TV for uh, e-cigarettes should be allowed. Um, basically, we have um, stopped advertising of cigarettes many years ago, um, but I would like to know um, what people feel about that. The BMA, in their submission, have made quite a powerful argument in the fact that they have concerns expressed 
uh, over e-cigarette uh, me marketing methods. Uh, these are being targeted at young people, whilst we're, we're bringing in an age limit. Um, the, the maybe near schools. You've actually went on to say that basically um, most people have said that e-cigarettes are in, in, in helping smokers to come off smoking to move to e-cigarettes. What you're su suggesting is we're actually having also the reverse, where people who are um, maybe um, trying e-cigarettes are then moving on to smoking. So you, maybe you want to uh, explore that. And I, I thought it was quite um, in your evidence. You also said that internationally it suggested that e-cigarettes uh, are acting as a gateway to smoking. So what's your view about advertising? What's your view about uh, or what's everyone's view in regards to the age limit being put in? Because let's face it, a child could walk into a shop today and, and buy an e-cigarette. Uh, hopefully not, but by the law, um, basically, we have to change it and ensure that uh, there is an age limit. So I'm advertising age limits, and I, I think, Mr Harley, you have to come in first in, in relation to this one. Yeah. All right, OK. Um, so I think our, our, uh, what we've seen uh, on a global basis, particularly in the, in the US, is the uh, manufacturers adopting many of the same marketing approaches that we saw for, for tobacco decades ago with, uh, with uh, a lifestyle approach that's aimed at attracting youngsters from a very early age into a, a lifetime of using a particular uh, product. And so we think there's, there's, there's uh, although potentially they may be a lesser risk than conventional cigarettes, we would nevertheless have the concern about um, uh, potential for addiction and luring people at, at an early age. But on the balance of harms, um, although there seems to be some evidence supporting uh, um, smoking cessation and, and, and uh, helping people to quit smoking amongst their existing population, um, that, that may be to some extent offset by attracting people at the other end. And we're not fully aware of all the harms yet that may be associated with e-cigarettes. And we do know that it's already that it's not entirely uh, harm-free, uh, which, which in our view very much points to the need for, for very clear regulation and very clear study of the of the harms. Okay, um, thank you. Anyone else want to come in in relation to to this? Councillor Johnson? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the challenge is obviously to get the balance right between assisting people to quit smoking by using e-cigarettes, but at the same time um, not leading um, new users into this market. Um, we, would, we would argue that TV advertising reaches everybody and therefore would not be acceptable because that could induce um, young people, uh, non-smokers, to perhaps look at this product. But we would equally suggest, as I said in my opening comments, that a point of sale advertising, um, which is appropriate, could actually assist people in, in moving away from smoking. And so we think that's about the balance currently, um, although we recognise that the, the jury is still out on the, 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 perhaps it will take a decade before the results come in to say that e-cigarettes are actually not harmful. Okay, um, before I take Richard back in, just to expand on that, yes, um, of course. Brenda? Uh, <coughs> we would uh, agree that uh, it's important to uh, reduce access to uh, e-cigarettes uh, by young people. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any kind of reason to try and induce young people uh, into use of e-cigarettes, apart from uh, increasing their use uh, of, of nicotine or uh, increasing profits of the people who are selling the particular products. Um, I think the other thing to, to perhaps bear in mind is that young people uh, perhaps are not the same as established smokers, so they pe will not have the same level of nicotine addiction. And so perhaps use of e-cigarettes will perhaps increase that addiction to uh, nicotine on the basis that it's safer. Uh, so the, the, I think the idea that uh, uh, e-cigarettes um, are useful in terms of uh, supporting people to stop smoking is, is uh, something to, to be pursued. <coughs> I think the restriction to uh, young people is something that we should uh, certainly put in place. 
Okay, um, and I know Mike McKenzie wants to come in and make a comment here. Please feel free to catch my eye if you want to on, so on age and on advertising. Anything on that, this will be your opportunity because then Richard will move us on to the next section, Mike. Yep. Just in, in relation, very briefly, convene in relation to the, you, you know, what we've just heard <laughs> from witnesses, um, I wonder if they could, would be good enough to share with the committee, perhaps in writing later on, if there is any evidence that they can uh, quote to support the views that we've just heard. I'd be very interested to see evidence, particularly from the BMA, who I would expect most of all to operate on the basis of evidence. Okay, now, Don, I'll come back to you maybe at the end to see a little bit more about that, but other folk have indicated the, 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 the wish in. Um, okay, we'll take... Um, Dennis is on, because we'll let witnesses be in, obviously they want to speak, but is on the, the same point, Dennis, and they can mop up these, these comments. Yeah, on you very much. Mind. Just to the point about advertising uh, at the point of sale, and it was maybe a point that Mr Johnson was making, should this advertising at point of sale um, include pharmacies? Okay, very specific. Uh, so I've now got my list of people I'm coming back to. We're coming back to Donald Harlan, we're coming back to Councillor Johnson, but Norman Proven, you've waited patiently once again. Yeah, just to say that we would support the age restriction in relation to these products. We don't. We think that there is a, a risk that this could be a new route to market for tobacco companies in relation to nicotine, so we would very much support the age restriction. In relation to the issue of advertising, we believe that there is growing evidence that e-cigarettes and vaping can be a good route to stopping established smokers from smoking, and that should be encouraged. And we would, in, in relation to your exact question about, for example, pharmacies, you could advertise products as a method of stopping smoking in the same way as nicotine patches and gum and all of the other um, uses of, of, of nicotine replacement products could be used. So we would have no objection to that type of advertising. But the principle of advertising on television to entice people um, to take up vaping in the way that people used to advertise to entice people to take up smoking, we would not support. OK, thank you, Mr Proven. Donald Harley, in relation to evidence, feel free to, to write to us, but I don't know if you want to say something about the evidence. Uh, I think we've provided it in, in our submission. There's a, there's a long list of references there. Right. OK, thank you. We will interrogate that more in more detail uh, after this meeting. Um, and Councillor Johnson? I think Mr. Mr Proven covered the points we would make. We would agree with his position that um, if pharmacists are going to be selling these products, it would make sense for them to have point-of-sale advertising um, as a, a, a non-smoking um, non method. OK, thank you. Yes, of course, Brenda. Just one, one issue is that... We, we would like, uh, in, in the smoke cessation field, um, uh, we would like a bit more evidence in relation to um, which particular products work best in terms of e-cigarettes. Uh, they, they are non-regulated, so it's difficult for the smoke cessation field to say, well, that product will work for you or that product won't. So what we do say is, uh, if you find e-cigarettes useful, we will support you with, your beha with behavioural support. But I think the regulation of the of the market in terms of support to smoking cessation should be looked at as well. So it's not just a case of advertising it, uh, just the product, but should be uh, if it's making claim to support smoking cessation, it should be better regulated. That's very helpful, and I wouldn't bring you back in, but I'll just put on record I saw Donald Harley's nodding head as you were you you were you were you were saying that. Um, Richard Lyle, do you want to move the, the conversation on? Yes, um, uh, can I turn to smoking uh, on NHS pre premises, particularly outside hospitals? And I have to, again, put on record, I, as a smoker, I abhor people standing outside uh, hospital uh, entrances. But uh, as a smoker, I also suggest that we should have a perimeter that people should be able to smoke, or even, uh, dare I suggest, that a, a shelter where people can be um, spoken to in order to uh, try and get them off smoking. You can maybe have someone standing beside uh, the, the shelter doing that. But basically the situation, most people coming out of hospital, haven't seen their, their loved ones, maybe have died or uh, have been told uh, they have a particular serious illness, People do come out and have a cigarette, but I would suggest that they shouldn't smoke. To go outside the perimeter of the hospital, and some hospitals can mean a quarter-mile walk, 
or can be late at night be dangerous. And let's face it, patients do also go outside hospital to have a cigarette. We all see them. Um, so I noticed that NHS um, Ayrshire and Aaron, and, and sorry, Brenda, I'm going to put you in the firing line, but I'm also going to put Councillor uh, Johnson in the firing line to ask him in regards to uh, the respect that I have for Cosla, that uh, Cosla's position, but in particular, uh, Ayrshire, and, I know Ayrshire and Aaron have moved, unlike um, other um, health author authorities in Scotland, have moved to a total ban, and it seems to be working. Can you explain the reasons why? Bring in a second that we'll, we'll maybe put them on the spot rather than in the firing line. Oh, but uh, rephrase that on the but, spot. Uh, but uh, yes, um, and, and I think you get a name check there, Councillor Johnson. So we'll come to you in a moment as well. So uh, Brenda Knox. Um, it, the, I suppose the the difference between uh, Ayrshire and Arden and some of the other health board areas is that we took a stepped approach to implementation of um, uh, smoking on uh, hospital grounds. Uh, and uh, our experience uh, with our first version, uh, which was uh, just after 2006 when the, the uh, first legislation came in, was that what we did introduce was a 15-metre rule, and that was about trying to get people away from the, the doors. And we found it totally impractical because people don't know what 50 metres is. Uh, to try and map that out around huge hospital grounds is al almost impossible. Um, uh, there is no one building, there isn't one building in a hospital campus, there's many buildings, so if you start to say 50 metres from that building, then 50 metres from that building, uh, so then it, it becomes complicated and it's confusing and people uh, really didn't like it and uh, therefore it opened up the, the, the route for people just to say, oh, well, I'll just smoke wherever I like. And that led to huge amounts of um, uh, uh, complaints from people coming through the doors and feeling that uh, uh, I thought you were supposed to protect us and you're not. Um, so uh, what we then looked at was our next phase was an stepped approach was that smoking in only one area, so it was a designated area, uh, with the view that we would move towards smoke-free grounds at some time in the future, which hadn't been decided, but then the, uh, the uh, guidance from the national policy came in, so then that's when we moved to smoke-free smoke grounds. Uh, I would say that at each level, the number of people who comply increases so what we're now moving to is a small number of people who are not complying. Um, and I would say that, generally speaking, the, the, uh, uh, the hospital doors are not, uh, uh, do not have lots of people uh, standing outside them smoking, although I think perhaps we're going to get into the situation where people think, because there's no way in which uh, uh, anything's going to happen to them, <laughs> then we'll just do it anyway. So that, that may well mean that there'll be a regressive move in, in the future. So we would welcome uh, uh, legislation that supports uh, uh, smoke-free grounds uh, um, because I think that the, the important thing is, is whilst it's about protecting people going in and out of the doors, it's also about the message that smoking uh, will harm health. And a health organisation... Uh, it has to get that message out to people. It's not about being anti-smoker, it's about being anti-smoking. And so therefore, if you have images of people standing around doors, uh, smoking in, on grounds, then what really the message you're given is, I'm telling you that smoking is harmful, but it's not really that harmful because we're not going to uh, 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 create an image of smoke-free within our, our grounds. And I think that's an important message. That that will be the, the thing that move forward, moves forward. What's made us successful, uh, I think, is because we have, uh, over the last year, uh, before the implementation, we had a plan we, uh, of engaging with people. We engaged with the general public. We engaged with local press. We had lo the local press were very helpful in, uh, uh, in, in uh, 
advertising and letting people know what the, the, the policy was going to be. We also now within the hospitals, all smokers are uh, are given an intervention by the Fresh Air, which is a smoke cessation service, to help them manage their smoking. So what, 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 what we have, or the officers have a conversation with, with smokers who are in hospital uh, for treatment uh, to look at the <coughs> options that are available to, to them so they can get uh, symptomatic relief, NRT, so that means that they're not making a commitment to stopping in the long term, but they're being given support to uh, uh, handle the, the um, withdrawal symptoms while they are in hospital. They're given some information about the importance of keeping the home smoke free so that that protects their loved ones, but also protects them. Also given some information about the, that how smoking can help them in the longer run uh, in terms of their health and, and, and uh, alleviating the situation. And if they want, they will be given support in terms of uh, trying to quit. Uh, and that's followed up when they leave and we give them telephone support and they're encouraged to go along to a, a, a group or to, to, to we'll meet with them individually when they feel able to do so. No, so I think that's yeah. that's helped us be successful. Oh, thank you, and we'll, we'll get you back in later when when when, when, the, when the discussion develops. And the councillor Johnson, you were you were you thought I'd forgotten about you, but I hadn't. Uh, you, you were name Take, checked. Um, I think the first thing I have to say is that the, the cause of position is that we're at, we're absolutely signed up to the principle of, of stopping smoking in public areas. What, what concerns us is the difficulty in actually delivering on that commitment. And we're not sure that legislation, first of all, can be justified currently, given it's only April since the NHS began the process. And local authorities um, have until the end of this year uh, to introduce that. And what we're talking about, I mean, for example, in my own council, we had a discussion, I don't know if you know, the Civic Centre in Livingston. Um, you may have seen it on the TV, it's where the High Court meets, and etc., and we have an area of about 15 metres currently where we have 15 metres from the door, there's no smoking allowed. So what happens is people then will gather from the 15 metre mark for the next 20 metres. Um, we're now going to extend that to the perimeter where the footpath comes. Um, and we're looking to do that by the end of, of this year. And we recognise that it's changing a culture that is going to deliver on this. Um, we're going to be looking to have no smoking in children's play areas. Um, but it's a long time since local authorities had parkies who maintained children's play areas or went round and enforced behaviour in children's play areas, which I suppose leads me on to the concern that if there is legislation, who's going to enforce it? Um, is it going to be local authorities who get the phone call? Um, again, coming back to an example in Livingston, there's somebody smoking in the grounds of St John's Hospital. Um, the civic centre is about a quarter of a mile from that. Are we supposed to send someone from the council up to enforce that? We don't have the resource to do that. Um, so what is the point in legislation that is not going to be enforced? And if we are going to proceed with legislation, and I think at this stage what COSO are saying, we don't know if that's the right way to go, um, but if it is going to be um, proceeded with, then the resources to enforce that have to be made available, or else what is the point of it? Uh, Mr Watson, were you wanting yeah. in? Yeah, yeah, I think on, the force on, might on. be on your mind as well, I suspect. I, indeed. Um, I mean, obviously we support the, the principle um, and, and have done uh, fr fr from the outset. There have been some areas where it's perhaps been clumsily uh, applied, but we've resolved those locally mm. in partnership with the, the employers. I do think we need to recognise that it's particularly our members in hospitals that find some, this can be a challenge. Security staff, porters and others who often end up having to try and, uh, and, and deal with these issues. I did, I did have some concerns when I initially looked at the, the bill when there was an offence of knowingly permitting others to do that and how broadly that might be applied. Uh, I think it's not entirely clear. I mean, the definition says um, having the management and control of the no smoking area. Um, you know, is that 
is that the the management's responsibility? Is, is is that an individual porter? Is that an individual security member, security staff? It's not entirely clear to me on on, on that basis. But I think the phrase "knowingly permitted" is probably fair, fairly good, and that might well give some comfort to our members. I think in terms of. Uh, uh, I understand why the issue of perimeter. I understand Brenda's point that it's very difficult to draw these lines, but you know it, it's it's not just one hospital. There are hospitals in Scotland that have enormous uh, areas of grounds, and and I think therefore you've you've got to have some way of dealing with that. I think it's going to be hugely difficult in signage and other terms to do this, um, but nonetheless, I think probably just saying a blanket it's all grounds is probably not very 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 practical. The last point I'd make is obviously the point that the enforcement very much as, as as Pete's point, we obviously represent the environmental health department staff as well, who, who are tasked with enforcing the, the, the current provisions. I have to tell you that resources in those departments, we produced a report last year, which was a survey of environmental health staff uh, who made the point that they've actually abandoned whole areas of legislation that they're supposed to enforce health and safety. In fact, even quite a lot of food uh, inspection, they've had to abandon that because of because of resources. The idea that you know they're going to be end of a phone charging up the hospital to enforce the the smoking, I think, is it just isn't going to happen. So, yeah, passing legislation is fine, and as I said in in relation to the parts two and three of the bill can change culture and that's why we've always supported the smoking legislation but we need to be realistic about the resources available in local authorities to enforce this okay thank you now i don't see any uh, of my msp colleagues or witnesses wishing to come in further um unless anyone wishes to catch my eye okay well we've got a little bit of a time in hand. So what we might do, if we're drawing to a natural close in terms of the questions that have been asked, is uh, we'll maybe just very briefly give each of the witnesses if there's something you want to reflect on from today's evidence. Um, not not a speech or a long statement, but you know, a couple of sentences give you the opportunity um, if you feel you haven't had the chance to say what you wanted to say, although I suspect given the fact that uh, we are now finished with our questioning, that may not be the case. But you never know, we'll start with yourself, Norman. Is there anything you want to... Well, as I remain a registered nurse and committed non-smoker, I feel obliged to do a brief intervention with Richard Lyle and tell him that smoking is very bad for your health and your health board can assist you with methods. My grandson at three is now telling me that smoking is not as bad for my health. <laughs> Indeed, but, but more seriously, I go back to the original point that we made in relation to parts two and three of the bill. That our fear is that part three of the bill will nullify the intent of part two. We very much support the principles of duty of candour, but we are less keen on additional legislation around willful neglect. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, Mr Watson. Yeah. I, I suspect you're, uh, Norman's wasting his effort with Dick on, on that point, but that's uh, a long history of that. Um, I, 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 I do think um, you know, there are some differences in our views on this one. I think it is a very fine balance. Uh, we, we accept that the risks in the bill in relation to if we don't focus on resources, the risk of unintended consequences is there. Uh, I think our, our consistent view, and this is why I highlighted violence to staff and other issues, is our consistent view is that legislation can drive organisational change but it will not do on its own so we would urge you to make that point very strongly that particularly in the social care area some of the things going on in Scotland now are not pretty um, and need to change um, but that is largely about organisational culture and resources uh, and we need to change the way that social care is commissioned in, in this country if we're going to raise the sort of standards as outlined in the bill. Okay thanks for putting that on the record uh, Brenda Knox. Uh, just to, to just to further emphasise the importance of uh, looking at uh, legislation to um, support uh, smoke-free legis smoke-free uh, grounds within hospitals, I think it's worth noting that uh, whilst we can uh, we can be pleased that uh, uh, prevalence of smoking uh, is at twenty percent at the moment, uh, prevalence of, of of uh, smoking and those with long-term conditions is 48%. And then I think you could most probably add on to that the people who had previously smoked but still have long-term conditions will add on another percentage on to that. So we do need to make sure that the message that we're given is absolutely clear that uh, a health organisation cannot really com be com <coughs> compromising the message uh, in, in relation to smoking. Okay, thank you very much. Now, you're, you're both more than welcome to speak, or one of you. It's completely up to yourselves, but we'll, Councillor Johnson. 
I think we have a couple of messages we want. I think, first of all, I think we're pleased to see that there's a clear consensus about the need for a duty of candour, and a clear consensus that we have no tolerance for, for poor care, poor quality of care. I think where we're seeing a difference is, from our perspective, we think these things are best delivered um, through culture changes, through improvement, um, and, and that way. And we are concerned, as others have said, about the possibility of part three negating part two, uh, something which we are, are absolutely concerned about and, and don't want to see happen. Um, but I think um, we've had a healthy discussion today, which we've been delighted to be part of. So okay. Beth, would you like to add anything? Um, yeah, I think so. Ju just to know, to echo Councillor Johnson's point about consensus, um, especially around willful neglect and mostly around duty of candour, um, but even, even Mr Watson, who's less convinced, um, or sorry, who's slightly more supportive of the, the duty of candour perhaps than, than ourselves, um, <coughs> even Mr Watson has highlighted that the, the problem we're, we're trying to fix here stems from really entrenched organisational issues um, which are mainly to do with lack of resources, with a historic lack of investment in social care. Um, and I think we as a society don't value social care in the same way that we do health care. Um, and this is going to have to be tackled. Um, many of these problems stem from um, pressures around resources, staffing ratios, um, low pay within the sector, which leads to problems with recruitment and retention. Um, so I think... In addition to simply saying, no, th this legislation is, isn't the way to fix the problem, I think we do need to, to start to move on um, to discussion about what is required. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, Donald Harley? Thank you. Just to re-emphasise that we think the ill treatments, uh, willful neglect section, although clearly well-meaning, we think in, in effect will be counterproductive. It will work against the openness, honesty, candour that we all want to build. It leaves... Uh, unaddressed the issue of culture in organisations, which is a real problem right across the NHS. It works against learning and developing uh, best practice, and uh, there's a real worry that uh, staff will pay the consequences of systemic failures. Okay, thank you very much. Well, can I thank all of you again for uh, for a very useful evidence session, helping the committee. Uh, uh, draft and uh, complete our stage one report for giving to the Scottish Government in relation to this bill uh, and that ends this agenda item and we now move into private session for agenda item three. Thank you.